You haven't moved too far. Not very far, but I was born in Namaru. Oh, OK, yeah. So the yeah. first four years I was in Namaru. Right, right. Yeah. When Dad went to the war in Trenton, yeah. at the finish, towards the finish, Mum came home to her parents over in Mill Creek. Uh -huh. And until the war finished, she stopped over there. So I was over there at the first four years in Namaru, then I went from Mill Creek, and then I went out to Spotters Creek, out over the way. The first, my first recollection, and it's only a faint one, is of where my mum and dad lived in Amaru on the South, South Hill, uh, and we had a corner house, and, and there was a, next to us, the section was about six foot higher and you climbed up a ladder and on that section, neighbouring section, was a vegetable garden and I can remember in that vegetable garden, nothing, not doing anything, but I can remember climbing up the stairs into that vegetable garden and that's about all I can remember of Amaru when I was uh, about four years old. We left Amaru when Dad went into the war. He was called up, married man with one child, conscripted in 1918 and went into Trentham. And when Dad went into Trentham, Mum came back to Moa Creek to her parents' farm and I came with her, with her of course. While I was there, before Dad came home from the war, from Trentham, uh, Mum took the bad flu and she was in bed... Was this the Spanish flu? It would be. It would be the bad flu in 1919. Mm -hmm. It would be the bad flu. And uh, I can remember her in grandmother's and grandfather's front room. I can remember standing beside the bed and Mum was very sick. And I can remember thinking how high the bed was. But it, it wouldn't be that the bed was so high. It was probably that I wasn't so very tall in those days. We left. Dad came home about uh, early in 1919. He was demobbed. He, he didn't go overseas. He was ready to go overseas. But war finished in November 1918. And Dad came home early probably early in 1919, and uh, then he moved to Chatter Creek and a blacksmith's job. At the blacksmith's job, we stopped, mum, mum and dad stopped at my uncle John's, John Love's property, and uh, we stopped in what they called the Red Shed. We shifted from Chatter Creek to Spotters Creek, which is halfway between Omakau and Matakanui, the school is no longer there. But I went, I started school there and we started school in a private house. The front room of a private house. And the people who lived in that house had four kiddies at that time. I think they had another child later, but they had four kiddies at that time. And the oldest one was a girl of about a year younger than I was. And I was only there for about a few months before Mum and Dad left Spotters Creek and moved over to the Crawford Hills in Galloway. And I can remember coming the first night we came to Galloway, we, we camped under the trees, by the creek, and we camped in a tent, and I can remember the rumble of the water and the lovely smell of, of the countryside. That patch of trees was the only trees for miles around. It had been a raceman's small holding 
while they looked after the Bonanza race around to the sluicing claim above Galloway. And they put up a two a two bedroomed galvanized iron house or dwelling that we lived in. It was very primitive, but that was what we shifted into from that tent in Christmas 1925. And how big was that piece of land that you moved on to? Uh, 400 acres it was, unfenced, rough, no grass, no animals, absolutely nothing. It, they were... Uh, we, Dad had bought three sections of returned soldiers' land which had been let out for settlement but had not been taken up because I think in hindsight the return soldiers had the other return soldiers had turned it down because it for us it was an awful struggle. Dad lived there and continued to work as a blacksmith at Chatter Creek, which meant he had to ride a push bike about seven miles over through run country, carry his bicycle over the railway bridge over the Manuharakia River and ride up alongside the railway line to Chatter Creek every day, five and a half days a week. Saturday morning they worked till one o'clock, half past seven till one o'clock. And for years he did that, about three or four years he did that. When he left the blacksmithing, he was well into his 40s, and to take up a new undeveloped section when he was well into his 40s, it was just too much. He killed himself with work. He, he was worked and worked and worked. He just... It wasn't light work. He always worked to the maximum of his physical strength. He shifted stones, he carried posts, he dug holes, he dug races, he, he did everything to the limit of his physical strength and it told on him. It actually killed him. When did he die? He died at 61. At 61? 61. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Mum died at 99. Yes. And I won't die till I'm well over 100. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's making resolutions. That doesn't mean to say it's going to happen, but that's the resolution. Here we are here standing up above the uh, original farm where your father bought the farm and what, 1924, 19, yeah. and uh, built a, a corrugated iron hut, you would call it, I suppose. It wasn't a house. Three, three in a row, corrugated, about 50 yards up from that wool shed, which we built shortly after. Yes. Uh, actually, our wool shed was better than our house. <laughs> so up, about 50 yards up on that track beside the road. Yeah. And our farm, this wasn't here then, our farm was below that, you can see a race there, that's an irrigation race. Yes. It came from the upper Manaburn Dam, and that, the one down, and that was our irrigation. We went along there and irrigated that too, but yeah. we had this side of the road way down. Yeah. How many acres was there? We had 420 there then. 420, yeah. yeah. And um, how long, when was the, when were those tin, tin huts pulled down? Uh, well, about, we lived in those for about, uh, about seven or eight years, I think, you know, yes. seven or eight years. And, and then, then we shifted down to where we eventually, Got a, a new house. Yes. Down there, away down by the further lot of trees you can see we passed coming up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was about seven or eight years. We lived here for about seven or eight years. Okay. Yeah. Right. So these are the uh, 
this was the land that you wandered and shot rabbits on and uh, oh, rabbit. your formative years of uh, rabbits were so thick here. Rabbits, rabbits lived up here in these hills and they come down and <coughs> when we start irrigating and got the nice green grass they just come down in hordes. <laughs> a lot of rabbits. It's quite a spectacular view isn't it? Oh, it's, it's a marvellous view. But up, up there when you come round, when you come round from Muller Creek over the top, right from the top you get the whole of this valley, the whole way, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't get a better view anywhere yeah. than that. Yeah. Because you come round the side of a hill and you see nothing. And then all of a sudden you see the whole of the whole of miles. You see, yes. you see the remarkables. Yes. Queenstown. Yeah. It's a terrific view from up the top there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, while you were a prisoner of war, did you used to dream about this land much? No. Lean beef and black tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you dreamt about. That's what I <laughs> Lean beef and black tea. <laughs> okay. Went to school in Galloway. In 1925 or 26, uh, 25, 26, I think it would be 26. I went to school for uh, possibly two, two months. I pushed a bike down to Galloway and back up at night, approximately six miles. And uh, after two months, I. I, I found it was too much, but possibly my parents found it was too much too. I went over and stopped with my grandmother and grandfather in Moa Creek, and I went to school the rest of that year at Moa Creek School. Moa Creek, when I was there, was a hub of activity. The year, the year I spent living with my grandparents at Moa Creek, there were a camp of workers constructing the race that went around the the Pulburn the Pulburn side of the valley. The race from the Moa Creek was put a, a big siphon was put across, and a race was constructed around the. Pulburn side, which was the east side, and th those workers were there all the time I was there, about 20 of them, camped a couple of hundred yards from my grandfather's homestead, beside a creek. And uh, there were rabbiters, public works men, there were always a lot of people, and the farms were still small, they hadn't been amalgamated. There were only well there were there were motor cars. There were motor cars getting in. Most of the most of the people at the top end of Royal Creek, by that time in nineteen twenty six, most of them did have motor cars. Most of them were Chevrolets and Chevrolets and Buicks. But they had other kinds of Studebakers and, and automobiles. Not many had, I can't remember any having Fords. They were all a bit higher than the Ford. The Fords were the low, lowest class. There were a lot of Chevrolets that were next up. What about English cars? Uh, no one in the valley had English cars. They all said they didn't track. Right. And a lot of the roads still had car wheels. Big deep ruts and the English cars had lower, uh, shorter wheelbase and they didn't, they didn't fit on the, on the mud and gravel roads. So they all went for American cars, all had American cars. But when I was there, Moa Creek had a school, they had a post office, they had a pub, they had a store, they had a football team, and they had a cricket team. And it, it, was, it, was, it was really alive. There'd be a hall there? 
Uh, that hole yeah. and dancers, mm -hmm. every week dancers. It, uh, it was alive. There were a lot of people there. So did you go to those? No. Go over the hill to them at all? From I, uh, I, Crawford Hills over, I, over the Red no, down to Mark No. I, I left, I, between 11 and 12, I was there. Mm -hmm. But when, when I got to at the finish of that year, Standard 4, I went back over the Crawford Hill and I only ever went back to my grandparents in the weekends after school. In the weekends I'd go back, but never, I never went to anything over there in the shape of entertainment. No, nothing like that. We just no. have a couple of names there. Here. What were the full names of your um, father and your mother? John Robert Clare and Lucy Ann Clare Nee Aston. Right. My grandfather's people were Astons okay. from Moa Creek. Because um, I remember Aunt Luce, who, who I know your mother is. Um, uh, Lucy know. Jane Clare. Yep. That was her name. I remember her telling me that she started on the first day of school at Moa Creek and she was there for the closure of the school. She started at the first day, but, but previous to the first day, she'd gone to school in a farmer's shed about a quarter of a mile away before they bought, before they built the new school. So she was a first day pupil, but it wasn't her first day at school. It was, she had been going to school in the farmer's shed for probably two to three years previous to them building the Moa Creek School. But she was a first day pupil, yes, and she was there at the finish, and I was there too. Uh, Thirteen years and eight months when I left Galloway. Thirteen years and eight months. I left with proficiency. And uh, while, while I was there, I, I had my first rifle, which was Dad's rifle. Uh, that was my, when I was 12 and 13, I shot every day with a rifle. But I got my first rifle when I was 13. Dad bought me a BSA rifle when I was 13. And I can remember the night he bought it home, I went and I shot five rabbits with it. I was so pleased to have it. <laughs> so plenty yeah. of rabbits around. Yeah, well, at that time, at that time, it was 1925, 26, 27, 28, rabbits were just everywhere because in the First World War so many men went away, so many didn't come home, but so many who came home were wounded or disoriented and there just weren't the men around to manually bring in the harvest, shear the sheep, to do the farm work, which was all done in the early 20s by horses. They never had time to, to, to kill rabbits in the summertime. They only killed rabbits in the wintertime and the rabbits bred like flies in the summertime and they were everywhere. But I had a wonderful time shooting rabbits when I was young. Was there any money in it for you? Yes, I used to make quite good money. And I used to buy most of my clothes by mail order from Dunedin. I can remember there was the two firms that were in Dunedin at that time, well, there were many of them, but the DSA and the DIC were two very prominent ones, and I always used to like the DSA. I think because the name, the, the initials DSA appealed to me more than DIC. <laughs> However, that was that. Uh, uh, when I left Galloway, I went in and boarded in Alexandra in the Parra Street and the house where I boarded is still there and I know where I lived, in the room I lived in and I can go to it right now. It's only it's three or four hundred yards from where I am here now in Chicago Street and that's one of the very few houses that are just as is except that they've put another room onto it. But it's, exactly as it was when I was there in 1925, 28, 
29, and on through the house. Three and years I boarded in that house and, and went to the Alexander District High School. When I left Spotters Creek at 11 years old, after about six years of wonderful mate, I went up on the Crawford Hill Road and I, from then on I had never had any mates at all. No, only mates I met at school. Never any mates to play with after school, because after school I had to come home. And when I went to the high school, I, I only had mates at school. I never went around after school with mates. I used to come home and I'd work around at the place where I boarded. They had an orchard. On, on the far street they had an orchard there. And I used to work around helping them on the orchard. And I never went back to have any good mates after I left primary school. 1300 passed and I was 69th in New Zealand. And in uh, the same year I passed the matriculation. Is and that equivalent to the school? Uh, the old university school entrance. Oh, university Un entrance. Matriculation was university entrance. But I was pleased to come home because my parents were poverty stricken and I, there was nothing else for me to do to come home. I remember you showed me a gold medal once that you... I got two school. gold medals. I got gold medal from the Galloway School, but there were only, there were only three in the class. And I got the gold medal from the Alexander District High School and there were 26 in the class. So I did well at school. Mm. I liked school, but I was pleased to come home. It, it was so free at home. Because I had a wonderful time, I was so free. I was 16 years and 8 months when I left school. And I, yes. And I was, I was free and I pleased myself. I practically pleased myself all my life. I went into the army and I pleased myself. I was in the prison camps in Germany and I pleased myself. And I came home and I had a small orchard and a small farm and I pleased myself. And I'm retired in Chicago Street and I pleased myself. <laughs> I will please myself until I die. Sounds like I have had a wonderful life <laughs> and I intend to live well past a hundred. Good on you. <laughs> I think you've got a good chance of that. And I haven't got far to go now. No. no. <laughs> the first couple of months after the school started, I missed the school routine. I did. I missed the school routine. For two or three months I thought to myself, well, what am I doing here? I could be learning things. And I'm learning nothing. I'm, I'm, uh, yes, it was. It was, uh, it was a nostalgic feeling. I'm missing out. But after two or three months, uh, I reconciled. And, I, 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 and from then on, I, I, I didn't consider school at all. Aston was born at Christmas, at Boxing Day. And uh, Aston was born, he was overdue. And uh, we had no telephone and we had no motor car. And he was overdue. But the arrangements Mum had made with her parents in Moa Creek was that when she needed them, she would get in touch with them, which meant I would ride over on the horse, I'd get in touch with them, and they would come over immediately in the car, because they had a car, they would come over immediately and take her into Dr. Gladstone's maternity uh, home uh, in Alexandra. But uh, things got desperate and one morning I had to saddle up the horse and ride over post haste and I stopped at the first neighbours, which was also by arrangement, I stopped at the first neighbours and they rang my parents and the idea was that they, they would ring my parents and my parents would come. But when I told my neighbours, asked them to ring my parents, they said, Yes, they would ring Pierce, but they immediately got in the car and they immediately came over and, and took Mum into the hospital. And that saved possibly another hour because I would have to run another 
two miles further on, and then the, the grandmother and us would have to come. So that, that was very good of the neighbours. That was the Barclays, they were our neighbours. On that side, they were about five miles on that side, and the Galloway side, the neighbours were Simons's, five miles on the Galloway side. So, so we, we had neighbours, but both lots of neighbours were five miles one side, five miles the other. Right. And what yeah. year was that? Ah, uh, that was 1920. I think yes, was born in 1928. Oh, did you see uh, Uncle did? Bob? Uncle Bob and I, Aunt, Aunt Ida. Yeah. When we when we moved to the Crawford Road in 1925, <coughs> Uncle Bob and Aunt Ida, who'd been uh, married couple. For, for my grandparents, mm -hmm. Aunty Ida's father and mother, mm -hmm. they'd been grand, they'd been a married couple since the war for a long time. They were grandfather set them up on two hundred acres, of nice two hundred acres, and they they also built a, a, a transportable house of galvanised iron one, and they lived there. And Edie and Jean, and Edie and Jean were still. Edie was two years younger than me, and Jean was four years younger than me, and uh, they were... I, I, I remember them quite well. I can't remember Herb, so Herb must have been... When I was twelve, Herb must have been two or three. Mm -hmm. Very, so, so much younger than he was just a... He, wasn't a, he, wasn't, he didn't get around with me. Right. But, but Jean and Edie did. Jean and Edie did. And they lived on the corner of the road, of the Crawford Road, where the Crawford Road meets the road up to the Manaburn Dam. They lived right on the corner. Mm -hmm. But there's no sign of it there now. Like, look, there's a house there now, but it's not in the same place as they were. They have, but it always, it was always unfortunate from my point of view, because I got on so well with Edie and Jean, because they were just my age, you see, two years. For a few months, for a few months after we shifted the Crawford Road, Edie and Jean and I, I and Bob were over there. And we went, Mum and, and I and Dad went over in the cart, we'd pass them on the way with the grandparents. There was somebody we knew, and somebody. We knew. After a few months, Uncle Bob drew Tiviot in the ballot and shifted away and another family, Williamson's, came and from then on I knew no young people at all. No. But for just those few months I had Edie and Jean, the young people, roughly my age when I was about 12, they were 10 and 8. Yeah. So that was just, for, for, for me, it was a disaster because I had someone my own age and they moved away. <laughs> But for them, it was a step up. Yes, yes. Yeah, step up. Yeah. What do you remember of uh, my grandfather? Because I never knew him. Uncle Bob? Yes. Well, Uncle Bob was... Uh, when I... Now, give me... I've got to get this thing straight. When, when I lived there, for 12 months, I was there, uh, I... I Every day I had breakfast and, and meals, no lunch was I went to school, but, and weekends, usually weekends I went back over to the farm and, uh, over the hill, so, but during the week, every day, my grandfather sat at the head of the table, Uncle Bob sat there, I sat here, Jeff sat there, Grandmother Ashton sat there, and Auntie Ida sat there, now, Jean and Edie, it, it, it must have been one of them, Jean or Edie sat there and one of them must have sat between me and Jeff. Now I just, I can't tell you where they sat, but they sat somewhere, mm -hmm. but it's quite clear in my mind, grandfather here at the head of the table, grandmother at the other side, at the other end of the long table. Uncle Bob there and I was up directly opposite Uncle Bob. And I knew 
Jeff sat next to Grandma at that end, and Auntie Ida sat next to Grandma at that end. Now, in the middle, I've got to fit in Jean and, and, Jean and Edie. And I, and I can't fit them in. Because Edie's pet, as we, we know pet, as pet. pet. I can't yeah. fit them in. Right. But they were there. <laughs> My mother told me a little about her father's early days, but not a great deal. He came out with, with a friend, uh, I've forgotten his name, I think it was Nettlefield, but I'm not sure. And they, uh, I think they landed at Afaroa in, uh, Christ, in uh, Canterbury, but he didn't stay in Afaroa very long, and uh, he landed, he came up into the Ida Valley quite early on, and worked, I think, over in the Manuherakia Valley before he came and worked eventually at the Ida Valley Station uh, at Pulburn. So he immigrated into New Zealand? He came from uh, Nottingham. Well, I think he was in his early 20s. Early 20s when he came from Nottingham. And uh, uh, yes, from England. That's right. Uh, he, he worked on the Ida Valley Station as an ordinary farmhand. Uh, and while he was there, he obviously took tickets in the Tattersall's sweepstakes, which was the only legal form of gambling, lotto or art union, or the only form of sweepstakes that was legal at that time. Sweepstakes weren't legal in New Zealand at that time, but they were legal in, in Australia, in Tasmania, and a lot of money from New Zealand went to Tasmania every week for the sweepstakes. And my grandfather was one of the lucky ones. He won in one sweepstakes five hundred pound. This was about eighteen early eighteen eighties. And uh, at that time the Ida Valley station was being uh, cut up to for settlement and my grandfather was able to buy a block of about 370 acres uh, in a rough state, but very cheaply. And with his 500 pound, he was a wealthy man in those days. Uh, he had a three bedroom house built on his farm, very well built by a tradesman, and it's standing today the original three bedroom standing today, uh, very well built. Uh, later they had uh, an addition built on and much, made it much larger, but nothing like as well built. However, uh, my grandfather prospered. He was a good worker and he was a, a man who, he was a teetotaler for say four to five months of the year and then he had one week on the booze. Right. About twice a year he had a week on the booze. And one, just going further ahead, one time he was on the booze after having taken sheep to Obercow, where they loaded the sheep from Mull Creek, they, uh, one time, having taken his sheep to over to Obercow and loaded them onto the train, he was celebrating at the uh, one of the smaller hotels. I've forgotten the name of it, but not Perkins's big hotel. It, one of the smaller hotels. He was uh, celebrating, and he walked out in the street and he was run into by a motorbike and you would never believe it the motorbike was a fella Coppin and he was a school teacher at Moor Creek <laughs> my grandfather had a very badly damaged upper leg and my mother who lived at Spotters Creek at that time she nursed him and I can remember he, he was in my, 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 my mother's, mother and father's bedroom, but the grandfather was put in their bedroom 
and I was sent to, to sh stay with neighbours. And for quite a long time, my grandfather was looked after by my mother. But he recovered, and that was one of his drinking, drinking bouts. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of the time, he never touched a single thing. Never touched a drink at all. And what was his poison? Uh, just beer. Oh, okay. Straight beer. But he, when he, when he, when he did drink, he loved having a party. And I can remember in the farmhouse at Moe Creek, when public works workers living in tents close by, he would, one of his drinking, in one of his drinking terms, he would invite a lot of his acquaintances, I don't know that there were actual friends, but a lot of these acquaintances down, and in the front room they'd have a sing-song. Someone would play the piano, and my grandfather and all his mates would have a big sing-song, and my grandmother was furious, because she never touched a drop. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but my grandmother went along with it because she knew it was a wonder. Right. The rest of the time it was stone cold sober. He was granted a four or five hundred pound loan and with that he had to construct a living quarters, fence his place, struggle with animals, which meant that the four hundred pound didn't go far enough and he had to get a long way in debt with the stock agent which was Dalgetty and Company. Now Dalgetty and Company were very good in that they, his, his father his father dealt with Dalgetty and Company, and his father was quite financial, and no doubt that helped my father, my father, to get credit from Dalgetty. And they were very good; they stood to him, and we were doing reasonably well in 1929 because wool prices and lamb prices were reasonably good in 28. 27, 28, 29, they were reasonably good. But the slump came in 1929, it started in 1929, and 30, 31, 32, 33, 34 were disastrously low. There's nothing ever been like it and never likely ever to be again as far as New Zealand's concerned. It, they were disaster because people had mortgaged themselves and they had no way of paying it back. We were poverty stricken, but Dad still managed to pay one pound a week board and he kept me going for three years in Alexandra until I passed my public service and my matriculation. And after three years, in 1930, he was so poverty stricken he couldn't afford to pay the board and I had to come home on the farm and work. I'll say this that I was pleased to come home on the farm. I got my rifle and I was happy shooting rabbits. So you were getting money from uh, rabbit, skin. rabbit skins? and Mum got it from cream. She was getting it from the cream? And Dad and had no money. <laughs> no because, money. because the stock firm, Dal Giddy, took the lot. But to he pay back no on the interest? No money. But when he wanted anything, when he, wanted anything he sent an order for groceries down to the, to the firm and they sent it up on the train. That's how we got our groceries. We got our groceries from the Deaton. Okay. Up in Bug. Pay the firm. Right. <laughs> we never saw a sign of it. Right. Oh, he, he was... He was entitled to think that the prices were going to remain up. Yes. Oh, was some... You couldn't sell a thing. No. So the price for sheep meat and wool and everything... Oh, was... he just... Like, give it away. Right, right. Like, all these big run holders were bankrupt. Yes. They were all bankrupt. But the firm couldn't allow them to go bankrupt, so they had to carry them. And you might have heard of the moratorium. No. Oh, well, it's just as well you didn't. Because they were all bankrupt, these firms. There were one or two. MacArthur's were, were viable, but they, they were long step, they were viable. Jobs at Mootery were viable. 
Neville's over in the valley were viable. There, there were probably a couple of others in this area were viable. Everyone else was bankrupt. Are you talking about farms or...? I'm talking about runs. 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 And farms. Right, OK. They were all bankrupt. Right. So the moratorium was built here. Yeah. Now, it was the moratorium that put Michael Savage in. Because the moratorium was... I saw, I, it was probably necessary, but it was horribly unfair. Mm -hmm. All the runs had had their mortgages wiped off. The government says, you don't owe them. And some of these runs had borrowed the money from private people, and the private people lost a lot. Because the government says, you don't have to pay those, you're forgiven. What you call a moratorium. You don't have to pay it back. So it was wiped off. And then two years later, prices went up, these run holders made a fortune, but they never paid the people back that they had for it. And that put Michael Savage in. Nothing else put him in. That put him in. Moratorium. Because it was so much. And that happened all over New Zealand. But if the government hadn't have done that, how would they have coped with all those run holders going bankrupt? Mm, mm. Hey? All over New Zealand. Bankrupt. It's sort of got a bit of a similar ring to today about it, hasn't it? Oh, it's nothing today. <laughs> today is it's, it's just peanuts today. Yeah. You, you you felt that it was much more dramatic then. Oh, it was it, it, it was prices were pretty good. Yes. Now all of a sudden nothing. It just went like that. It's interesting, um, I mean, you're describing run, big runs, and then you're describing small farms that weren't allowed to be bigger than 400 acres. That's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that was a law? That was a law, yes. What, and So that was to stop people building up bigger and bigger farms? That's right, it was, yeah. And it was successful too. And, and um, but they were allowing to, allowed to, people having runs were allowed to... Uh, they, they kept them. They yes. kept them. And a lot of those, a lot of the land in those runs would have been crown land leased. Uh, oh, probably all crown land leased, but no freehold runs. Well, no. probably were some. I think, I think Mootry, out here, I think Jops, I think it might have been freehold. Okay. But they, they were a wealthy family. And MacArthur's would be freehold. Wealthy families, Neville's. They'd have leasehold, but they they had freehold too. They they were they were wealthy. Okay. That's right. Everybody else behold on. No one else would even dream of selling, mm. because because if you sold, you'd be unemployed. You wouldn't get a job. So with those deep memories of indebtedness and the depression and poverty, what does that? How does that affect your own life? Uh, oh, well, I'm cautious, put it that way. And, and when I sold my farm, <coughs> when I sold my farm at Galloway, I sold it very well, but I put practically all the money in the reserve bank at, a, at what was then a low interest because it was safe. I could have got approximately twice as much in private companies. Bridge Corp and these companies, I could have got probably twice as big an interest. But the sum taught me your principal is far more important than your interest. And I never lost a penny. Mm -hmm. The only thing I lost was interest. I never lost a penny of principal. And a lot of people lost principal. Mm. Interest is nothing. It, it, it's the principle I lost nothing. That's what the son told me. If you've got something, it's valuable. I, I was only home about a few months and I bought some fruit trees and I planted them. And each year I planted a few more and I was trying to work up an orchard because we, we needed a better income from that 400 acres it was, a lot of it was just unproductive run country mm -hmm. and it was never going to be a very profitable unit. It could have been helped by a small orchard. So I planted a small orchard, but, it, but only in stages. 
because I planted it with my own money that I got from the rabbits, rabbit skins. Uh, my father never gave me any money. He had no money to give me. His money was all tied up in buying fencing and equipment for the farm. So he had no money. But I did get money from selling the rabbit skins because they were reasonably good price in the early days. Uh, Nothing for the meat? Me pardon? Nothing for the rabbit meat? Uh, yes. Uh, when, before the slump came, the skins were... You didn't bother about the meat because the skins were a good price. When the slump came, the skins were down in value and the rabbit factory in here in Alexandra, uh, it wasn't a factory, it was a, a freezer. You caught the rabbits, gathered them, hung them on the fence, a lorry came around and collected them and took them into the freezer and they were frozen in the skins, gutted mm -hmm. and frozen in the skins and sent to England, I think. But the price was very poor. I'll tell you how poor it was. I started trapping rabbits, every, everybody started trapping rabbits, in February, the 14th of February when that freezer started. And the, start, the going price was, in today's money, it was $1.25 for a hundred rabbits caught, gutted and hung on the fence by the road line. One dollar twenty-five. In those days it was twelve shillings and sixpence a hundred. That was the 1930 slum. It, it was something to read about. It, the whole money system completely collapsed. Single men were given ten shillings a week to live on. That's one dollar. Mm. One dollar, ten shillings was one dollar. They were given one dollar a week to live on. And they could catch rabbits for meat. And how they lived on one dollar, it's anybody's guess. They, they, they were just poverty stricken. They were able-bodied men. Able-bodied men. Good soldiers. Physically fit. Ten dollars, one dollar a week. The slope was deadly. And it carried on from, thir it, it started in 1929, but only a few months. All 30, all 31, all 32, all 33. It was beginning to come over in 1934. And only, only started to get better in 1934, because first Mussolini in Italy boasted that he had four million bayonets. In other words, he was arming a, a, an army of military age soldiers and he boasted his four million bonus and he went into Libya and Abyssinia and not to be outdone Hitler one year later in 1935 took over in Germany and he at that time didn't boast about four million bonus but he outdid hit Mussolini but quite a lot. He had more than four million bayonets, but he not only had bayonets, he had tanks and aeroplanes and he bought things. Mm -hmm. And Mussolini buying and Hitler buying, prices went up. I see. And our slump went over. Right. The first year I came home, I planted a block of early, early uh, maturing green peas. In those days, he used to sell green peas in the pod to Dunedin, and he got a price for green peas in the pod. You don't, you don't do that now, but in those days, they didn't freeze dry them, this sort of thing. They bought them in the pod. And for Christmas, there was good market. After Christmas, they were hardly worth growing. But for Christmas, People in those days always had green peas and new potatoes, lamb. It seemed to be something that they'd pay anything for. Well, <coughs> I planted a block up there on the Crawford Hill Roads, on the side of a hill, in the park which I was going for an orchard. Mm -hmm. It was fenced off, away from the rabbits. And 
I looked after it and it grew and I had a beautiful crop. I had a beautiful crop. Pete, with the wonders, I'll never forget the with the wonders. They matured, they're about as long as your finger, and seven or eight fully formed peas, pods fully flushed out. A marvellous crop. And they, they they were ready a week before Christmas and right on through Christmas. A marvellous crop. And I I picked them for all I was worth, and then I had to yoke up the horse and take them down to the station, and I cursed the slow speed fish. I cursed the time that I was there because I wanted to pick, pick, pick because they were there. And you know, <coughs> Dad wouldn't help me, Mum wouldn't help me, and I picked up my own, and I had to catch the horse and take him down to the station to my own. Galloway Station? Yeah. Do you know how much? This was the slump, 1930, when man was getting a dollar a week. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much I made in that week? Thirty pound. Wow. I could huge I, amount of money. I could have made a hundred pound. Yes. Yeah. If I had pickers. Yes. And I had to had to take catch the down. horse. Yes. Take it down. Put the stuff on the train. Come back, and then. Walk about a quarter of a mile down to the blasted orchard and pick, 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 pick. Broke my heart because it was money. Yes. Do you know how much I got for a pound? The, the going rate for peas at that time, mid season, was a penny to a penny half a pound. Do you know what I got for my, my peas? And, oh, do you know why I got it though? Do you know why I got it? On the 27th of November, there was one horrific frost. Right. <laughs> and wiped out every pea in, in, in central Otago. Yes. It did. It wiped them out. Yeah. There were none. And I got... Except yours. I got... <laughs> it never touched mine. Right. It, yeah. On the side of the hill, it never touched them. Oh. I never had the slightest sign of frost. Never touched it. And I had a bumper crop. And I can remember the fellows down at the Galloway Railway Station, they couldn't believe it. I can remember still a fella who did grow peas, a fella crew from over in Springvale. He came over and he pulled one of mine out and looked at it, felt it fully developed. Couldn't believe it. Mm. Couldn't believe it. Mm. All his had been frosted. Not a damn sign of it. I was getting sixpence. Did that was fifteen shillings a sugar bag. Mm. Mm. The thirty pound sugar bags. And I was picking on I was getting a lot of sugar bags. I got I picked hard. I picked hard and long. So you just packed them into into sugar bags? Just into sugar bags. Yeah. Yeah. Dumped them in, pushed them down, sewed them up, mm -hmm. labelled them, wrote out consignment notes, I did the whole lot myself. Right. And Mum and Dad Dad was he never bloody well helped. He he, he never helped. <coughs> On the other hand, that was your money. Yes, but he should have helped me. <laughs> he should have helped me. And then I could have helped him. He could have right. He thought, he thought, I'd only be getting tuppence and threepence. Not worth it. Not worth it. Right. But I was kidding. But you see, for the first two or three days, I didn't know what I was getting. In those days, you know, there was no telephone. No. First two or three days, I didn't know what I was getting. And when I got back and it was six and six and eight a pound, fifteen shillings of sugar back. <laughs> oh God. And the worst part of it was there were still sugar bags by the dozen, sugar bags by the dozen. They were still there at New Year. I couldn't pick them. Couldn't run. Yeah. And then Penny Hake me pair. Hardly worth picking. The command was over. Huh? Yeah, it's over. Yeah. As soon as Christmas Eve got no sale for them. Yeah. Mm. Even though there were none, nobody bought them. Mm. Mm. But ah, oh, 30 pounds, that helped me to buy the fruit trees so. though. Right. Well, I'll tell you how busy it was, the train. The train went to Cromwell in those days. Mm -hmm. it, it came from Dunedin at about 8 o'clock in the morning. You had morning tea at Hendon in the gorge. You had 
midday meal at Renferley. You had afternoon tea at Overcamp, and you had got off the train at Cromwell oh, around about five to six at night. So it wasn't fast. <laughs> it was a big day. Yes. But so that would have stopped at just about every little siding and... And, and shuttered. Yes. Shuttered and picked up train. Shuttered and picked up, shuttered and picked up. So was it a mixed train? Like a mixed, oh and yes, it was mixed. mixed. There were only two to three passengers. At, at, at one time they had first a first class carriage. Yes. And always one or two, depending on the numbers, one or two second class. Whether they continued to have first class carriage until they stopped the passenger trains altogether, I, I can't remember. But my early recollection, they always had a first class carriage. Was there and any... I can remember with the, the white sheets on the, on the seats. Oh, okay. Was there anybody, anybody ever in it? About two or three in the full <laughs> carriage, yes. Right. Well, everybody's second carriage. Yes. But yes. doctors, and I suppose big run holders and lawyers and that sort of thing, the, uh, two or three. Yes. It was never full. Okay. And I can't remember whether they, whether they ever cut that out. So you, you actually started out in business as an orchardist at a very difficult time. Very difficult. And how, how did you get past those first four years? Well... I never got a wage, no wage at all. <coughs> but in the winter time, I trapped rabbits and sold the skins and helped on the farm. Of course, I helped on the farm. One year, one year I shot, I, I shot eight hundred sheep myself, but with a blade. And the best, uh, the, the most I ever shot in one day was eighty. Because in those days, they were old marina sheep, and when we come to shear them, they hadn't been crushed. They were daggy, and all second growth. They were they were difficult to shear, and I was I only shore once a year our sheep, mm -hmm. so I wasn't used to it. But and, and the top I ever did was eighty. But I also had to help my father round the men off the paddock. Help him with the, in the shed at times, and it, it was from early morning to late at night, it was a very difficult time, because my father had no money. In 1935, everything started to lift immediately. <clears throat> and probably the main reason was Mussolini was at the peak of his power. He, he crowed that he had four million bayonets and he went in from, from Libya, he went to Eritrea on the Red Sea and then he went into Abyssinia and he was, as I say, he crowed that he had four million bayonets. He, he had roused Italy from a stupor into a, almost a modern state. And not to be outdone, about 1933, 34, 35, Hitler, also in Germany, modelled his success on Mussolini and Stalin. And he grabbed Germany with the scruff of the neck when they were in deep depression and provided everybody with work and built an army just about twice as good as Mussolini's. But to do that, there was a... And then when they built those big armies, England started to buy to replenish herself, France started to build, yeah. to counteract them, and America was helping them. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, Japan had been fighting in China for years. She was getting stronger and stronger, and everything started to go. All of a sudden, in 1935, after five to six years of absolute deep depression, all of a sudden, 1935, it went up and there was a boom. And from 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, it just went up and up and up. 
that it was it was so obvious war was coming. It right. was a certainty. Yes. Everybody saw it. It was a certainty. And it came. It was in the news every day and on the radio. We had a radio. Yeah. It was on the news every day. And what were the, what kind of things were they saying? Uh, well, they were saying that Mussolini was hell-bent on war, and he had he had the limelight for two years anyway, mm. because he came into he came into power in Italy about 1922, mm -hmm. and he built up over many years, oh, many that. years. Yeah. Whereas Hitler only came to power in Germany about 1933, and within about three years he was. Big. Italy had no industrial base to compare <coughs> with Germany. So, although Mussolini was a great organiser, he didn't have the industrial muscle to really be a, a major power. But he had the he had the desire to be big, mm. and he made the use of what he had. Mm. And as I said, he went to Eritrea, he went to Abyssinia, and he was bent on going further if he could. So the flavour of the political opinion of the time was that he was a bad guy? Very much so. Right. Very much so, yes. Of course there was a League of Nations. Yes. Which did nothing. No. And when Hitler, when Hitler came to power, the first thing Hitler did when he came to power, he turfed the French and British out of the Rhineland, because they were occupying the Rhineland. Then the next thing he turfed them out of the Saar, which was uh, 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 like like Gaza Strip is to Israel. Mm -hmm. It was a, a small coal mining area, which the Germans claimed, but the French had occupied after the war. Well, Hitler was not, not after he turfed the peacekeepers out of the Rhineland, then he turfed the French out of the Saar. The next thing, he turfed the Czechs out of Sedate and Yale, and then he, made, he decided to kick the Poles out of the corridor. And that's when France and Britain said it had enough and mm -hmm. war broke out. So just leading up to that, um, <coughs> you were hearing this on the radio, you were reading it in the newspaper. Every day. Every day. It was coming. Right. There was, was no action, it was coming. Okay. But. Yeah. <coughs> But, but why? But I mean, um, Chamberlain was uh, <coughs> prime minister at the time. And Chamberlain was a wonderful man. Yes. But people think he wasn't. People think people think Chamberlain peace in our time. Yes. Do you know what happened with Chamberlain? No. He went over and talked with with Hitler. Yes. And when he came back, everybody said, "Oh, he's agreed to let the Germans have Sudeten land and the Czechs to go back, and there'd be there'd be no war." And everybody said, oh, he's, he's weak, he's yes. weak, he's let Hitler do that. <coughs> as soon as Chamberlain came back, <coughs> he put the Navy on full alert. He issued orders to the Air Force, get into it. Yeah. Everything has got to be top speed. He brought in, all in the space of a couple of months after he came back, he brought in national service for all British jokers who were eligible, including men with one for kitty. Including men with one kitty, not just single men. Mm -hmm. All those who were eligible. So, he, Navy, Air Force, Army, full preparation. And it was 12 months later when war broke out and they were still preparing. Yeah. That's why they had an Air Force. If, he, if, if Chamberlain had said, we're going, to, we're going to stop you going to Sedate Land, mm -hmm. Hitler had an Air Force at that time, and he would have just walked over and smashed London because they had no Air Force. So it was the delaying tactic? Uh, Chamberlain was a, a miracle man. Yeah, okay. The that's public thought he was soft. And that's, that's certainly the um, legacy that he has. That he was soft. Yes. That he... he, he he saved Britain. Britain was like New Zealand, defenceless. Yes. They, they had a skeleton army. Mm -hmm. their, their navy was run down. Their air force was struggling. Mm. 
They had a skeleton army. But the moment he came back, they activated them into it. And <coughs> one of my mates in the prison camp was George Langhorn, a married man with a nine-year-old son. He was sent to France with three months' training, conscripted into the National Service Army, mm -hmm. only had three months' training, married man, one no, nine-year-old son. This, this is birth man. And, and he went over there and he was taken at Dunkirk and he spent five years as a prisoner of war. But he was a national serviceman. Right. Called up when Chamberlain came back, called up. He only had three months training. Well, he would have had no training at all if he had an attack earlier. Right. But at least he had three months training. Yes, yes. Michael Savage. He reigned over a cabinet of conscientious objectors. Mm -hmm. Semple, Webb, half a dozen of his other objectors, Armstrong, they all conscientious objectors, wouldn't fight. And yet, when war broke out in 39, oh, they all got to fight. We went into the war with five rounds of ammunition. Mm -hmm. A single shot, you know, a single shot, bolt action, Five rounds. Absolutely nothing. We had nothing in 39. Build more houses, wooden houses. That was going to solve the whole world's problem. Oh, but it, it was it most annoying, I tell you. And yet, um, New Zealand declared war. Uh, same time as it, uh, at 24 this. hours after Britain. <laughs> yes. And yet they had nothing. Yes. That I knew that when war break out, I would fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew. I, 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 I wanted to go. I wanted to fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Well, I was single, 25, 25, six months, and I was fit, mm -hmm. and I, I could use a rifle, and I, I, I wanted to fight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was that a pa patriotic thing or a sense of ah, adventure? A patriotic thing, very much patriotic. Right. Yeah. It, it wasn't. It wasn't just a personal thing. I think I, I wanted England to remain our homeland, mm -hmm. and I wanted England to be great, mm -hmm. and we wanted to be part of it. And I knew we'd be part of it. And I want. That's what I wanted. See, I think that that's was a, a big empire. Yes. It, we 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 controlled India. Yes. We had a, and I, I, was, I wanted to be part of it. We were part of the empire. We, we were part of the, of, the, of the empire that controlled India. But if, it, <laughs> right, right. But, if, but if you think about it, there would have been lots of Indians and Africans who would have been part of the empire too, but didn't feel like they were. <laughs> no, but, but uh, they were, there were quite an awful lot of Indians who were in the army too. Yes. They did. They fought. Yes. yes. The Indians fought too. I went to need of examination. And I passed. Right. And I was in, in camp on the 2nd of October. Right. Yeah. What yeah. did your parents think? Hey. What did your parents think? Uh, oh, well, Dad understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He understood. Yeah. And your mother? Well, I don't know what Mum thought. Yeah. Oh, I don't think Mum. You were the only. Oh, no, you weren't the only son. When was. No, um. Aston would have been born by. Oh, then. yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. He, he was. Uh, twelve. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah. Twelve and, and forty. Yeah, yes, he was twelve. Twelve. And Nolan was sixteen. Okay. Seventeen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he went down to Needham and signed up. Yeah. Uh, and um, passed the exams off to camp. And, and was called up on the 2nd of October. Yeah. And you went to where? Burnham. Burnham. Burnham, yeah. Many there then? Uh, we, 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 we went down, I went down on the... Uh, on the, on the train from Cromwell and stopped the night at the Levant Hotel and formed up on Queen's Gardens here in front of the Cenotaph mm -hmm. and I think it was right was the mayor at the time. He addressed us all in, in ordinary clothes, no uniform, ordinary mm -hmm. clothes, and uh, we, 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 we didn't march, we, we walked over to the station and 
the train from Invercargill came with all the fellows from Invercargill who was on it. It was a troop train, yeah. but they're all in civilian clothes, mm -hmm. all, all the recruits. And we pulled up at, at uh, Burnham on the side of the track, not at the siding, yeah. the side of the track, beside the road, and we all got out and walked up the, up the road up and entered the camp. Right. Yeah. yeah. How many do you think would have been on that train? Oh, quite a few hundred. Yes. Quite a few hundred. And these were all volunteers? Absolutely, all volunteers. All volunteers. Yeah, all volunteers. Yeah. And what were the age groups? Uh, there would be fellows here, 50. Yeah. They and, took and, people at that age? And about, and, and about 18. Yes. Yeah. They took 50 year olds? Not really. No. They, they, they put their age back. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Must have dyed their hair, put their age back. And there would have been a few underages too. Oh, yes, they were older than yes, they were. Yes, there were jokers here at 18. Yeah. yeah. How old were you supposed to be? Uh, 20. Okay. Yeah. You could go you could go if you were 18 if you had your parents' consent. Uh-huh. Right. But if they if they uh, decided that they didn't want you to go, you had to wait for 20. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you were off. Oh, um, I was right, yes. Yeah, you right, arrived in uh, Burnham and then it was an army life which would have been a bit of a shock coming from uh, no, was no Central problem. Data. No, there was no problem. No? None at all. I, I had boarded for three years in here yes. for the high school. So I knew what a way from home was. Right. And I'd spent 12 months in Nelson about 1935, just, just as the sun was finishing, I spent 12 months on a commercial export or apple orchard in Nelson. So I'd been away from home before. Yeah. So I, I died no trouble in the army, none okay. at all. Yeah. What about with the um, discipline and the officers and that rank and and uh, you know army discipline? Have no they, problem no at all. No problem then? No problem at all. Uh, no I found it easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it easy. Okay. No, no problem. So you got a uniform and a gun? Yeah, uniform and a gun. Uh, I can't remember getting any ammunition, but we uniform and a gun. <laughs> we, we got five rounds of ammunition eventually, but but start, I don't think we had any. So what Just was the gun? gun? Hey? What was the gun? 303. Yeah. Bolt action, 303. Right. Heavy, and I suppose it was accurate, but uh, it was a, it was an old 1914-18 one, and uh, they're heavy and uh, they just didn't seem right. Right. <laughs> okay. uh, I tell you what, the German guns, were, the German rifles were far easier. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, they 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 had a feel to them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Our fellows were just you know, like lumping, like just lifting a, a log of wood up, heavy and, mm. and cumbersome. The German rifles. I had a German rifle after the war. The German rifles were they, they come up, come up. Yeah. Everything the Germans did with military equipment was was done to perfection. Right. Yeah. right. How long were you on the camp for? Uh, uh, we we left on the uh, Danira Indian troop ship mm -hmm. from Littleton on the fourth of January. So October so to January. Second of October to the fourth of January is the camp. Right. Yeah. Okay. And what what did training? And then, uh, in the you know, in that camp entail. Well, uh, the, the, the first thing I can remember is, and this this is one thing that I, I didn't approve of really. The first thing is, Revelli. You'd you'd, uh, you'd all get, you'd all be, waking up, mm. and uh, you got you got into your clothes, just your ordinary ordinary clothes, not not. Not full uniform, different. And you you were down on the parade ground and formed up. What time? Six o'clock. And then you had about quarter of an hour running round, running round as fast as you can go, <laughs> running round the parade ground. That was exercise. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't. I usually like something to eat before I run around. <laughs> or a drink of tea. Yes. But yeah. No. Get out of bed, get into your clothes, out there in the playground, and then 
running around for about a quarter of an hour, and hit a whole lot of you, and then back. When you come back in, you had to make your bed, and it had to be specially made, everything just the way that they wanted it done, that's right. And then you stood by your bed, and then you got the call for a bugle call for, for breakfast. And you rushed out and queued up and went and had your breakfast. Now, uh, from then on, it was, uh, it was just more or less routine, you know. You come back, you, you'd be in the, in, in the barracks a while, and then you'd be called out for a parade, and you'd have your rifle and you'd do a drill. Yeah. But it was that running around that exercise, PT. PT, yes. Now, that, I wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you had, what, six months in the camp? No. October. Oh, no, sorry, three months. Yeah, three, three months. months. Three 2nd months. of October to the yes. 4th of January. Three months in the camp. Yeah. And then you were off. Did, did that, um, in retrospect, looking back, was that training of any use to you when you got to uh, got to the war? It probably was for a lot of people, but for me... It's a funny thing, but I was intelligent enough to obey orders without having it pushed into me. It, it's a matter of intelligence. I, I think it, it was necessary for a lot of jokers who wouldn't obey orders, but I would obey orders. And uh, I, no, I, 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 I could have, I could have done with a fortnight's training. Yeah. Okay. I, I think three months was wasted. Yeah. Right. Um, what were the officers like? Uh, you couldn't fault them. Mm -hmm. But you didn't see much of them. It was the sergeants who took the drill. No, you didn't see much of the officers. Okay. But they, 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 they were no problem. So this, well, this see, there was... The, most of the infantry platoons were 30 men and one officer. About three sergeants and one officer. And the sergeant took it, and, and the, uh, the officer was just an overseer. But, but we had only 18 in our platoon, it was a mortar platoon, one of those you three, but, so there were only 18 in our platoon, so we had an officer for 18 men, so we, we saw relatively, I suppose, a bit more of him. But, but he, he was no problem. So he was regular army? Uh, he'd been in the territorials. Okay. Yeah. What about your sergeant? Who? Oh, yeah. sergeant. Uh, yes, he'd been in territorials too. So yeah. neither of them were regular army? No, not regular army. Okay. Territorials. Territorials. Yeah. The, 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 comp the, the, the company sergeant major and the regimental sergeant major were regulars. He left from Littleton. On an Indian troop ship, the Danira. Why, why do you call it an Indian troop ship? Well, it wasn't. It was, it was a troop, it was a troop ship used by the British Army to transport soldier, regular soldiers from Britain to India. Ah. And it was crewed by Laskers. It was an Indian crew. Laskers? Uh, they're, they're Calcutta Indian seamen. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And how big was that? Uh, well, it took seven or eight hundred men. And that was the first group to go from New Zealand? Yeah, well, we were the first echelon, yeah, first group. There was a, there was a, a scouting party left earlier, but that was just a hundred men or something. Right. But 6,000 men went in this first lot. <coughs> uh, we went from, from the South Island, from Littleton, and we joined others from Wellington, and the Auckland ones joined later. Okay. Where? I don't know where the Auckland ones joined, but the Wellington ones joined us to Cook Strait. Oh, I see, as part of a convoy. As part of a convoy, yes. Right, right, okay. And then you headed to? Uh, Perth. Perth. Yeah, uh, Fremantle, that's the harbour. How long did that take? Oh, over a week, okay. over ten days. First time at sea? Uh, I'd been across on the ferry along the Nether from Littleton to Wellington. Okay. So yeah. it wasn't exactly the first time. But it would have been different conditions on a troop ship. Uh, much different, yes, yeah. much different. What yes. were the conditions? 
Hey? What were the conditions like? Uh, they were pretty basic. On the, on the Indian troop ship, we, I think 16 of us, 16, perhaps 18, uh, no, 16 I think, we ate, ate aside on a table, we, we ate, ate, ate aside on a table, and at night we went, formed up and went down each table, each table in its turn. At night we went down in the evening, below deck, picked up a hammock, brought it up and slung it head and tail above the table where we ate. Sixteen men slung in hammocks above the table where we ate. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what we did all the way to uh, Port Sewers. And washing facilities? Uh, Yeah, I've forgotten. Okay. I've forgotten the washing facilities. Obviously, we're washing facilities. Mm. I've forgotten. Can't remember. And did you get seasick? Uh, I got seasick, yes. I got seasick. But I was. Uh, it was partly to do with the vaccinations. Uh, and the smallpox vaccination brought me out in dozens of white pimples around my neck mm. and gave me. A frightful headache, where the, the type of headache that every time the boat went down and up, the top of my head from from the forehead up, it lifted up and came back, and lifted up and came back. That was the headache I got. Mm. That was the the smallpox vaccination had worked on me, so I was allergic to smallpox. It was but. That, of course, made me immune. Right. Yeah. yeah. But oh, it was a thump and headache, and in conjunction with that, I was seasick. So was pretty miserable. Pretty awful. Yeah. But I wasn't as bad as some. I saw some Jovers lying in the scuppers, that's lying round the side of the boat, with the little uh, waterways around yes. the side, yeah. lying down there, Vomiting into the into the scuppers. So you got to Cairo. Yeah, uh, we didn't stop in Cairo. We, we were up about uh, ten mile out at one of the suburbs, mm -hmm. and then our camp was up in the desert. And which camp was that? Mardi. Mardi. Yeah, Mardi. Yeah. Was that a completely Kiwi camp? Was it? Yes, only Kiwis. Only Kiwis. So you would have got there. Wouldn't have been many there, would there? Uh. No, we'd be the first there. Yeah. Uh, now wait a minute now, it was all tents, but right. there were one or two wooden buildings, yeah. so oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who would have built the wooden buildings. The British the British Army would have built them expecting us to come over. Okay. Because the, the British regulars were at Abyssinia, they always always had a, had a they always had a base at Abyssinia. Mm -hmm. They would have come over and built the, the wooden buildings, but the the rest of us were in tents. There wasn't a great deal to do on me. It mm. was just a matter of going in and round. Because there were brothels there. Yes. But uh, the, the, the <coughs> 20 cents, 20 cents, which was a fifth of an Egyptian, of uh, piastres. Yes. 20 piastres, which was a fifth of an of a Egyptian pound. 20 cents would, would give you a a trip to the brothel mm -hmm. when we came. Yeah. That was the British Army regulars had arranged they would pay 20 cents. Yeah. When we came, the, the brothel owners must have seen 6,000 of us. Yes. And they must have seen a big demand mm -hmm. and a limited supply, <laughs> and the price went up to 40 cents. Right. Yes. It, it very nearly brought a revolution from the British because they had to pay twice as much and they didn't have much. And the first echelon was 6,000. And what did it build up to? Uh, well, each, each echelon, second and third, but the second echelon went to England, you see. The second one did? Yeah, the second one went to England. Okay. They, they they were coming to they were coming to us and they got to the 
to the uh, to Aden, the Gulf of Aden. And as they got to the Gulf of Aden, or were approaching the Gulf of Aden, Italy came into the war. Well, Italy controlled the coastline along Eritrea, yes. the coastline of the Red Sea, so they switched and they went around South Africa. Ah. And then they didn't bother coming through the Mediterranean, they went straight on to England. Okay. So they went to England. And we didn't see them again until we went to Greece. Okay. A, about a fortnight before we went to Greece, they joined us. Mm. But the third echelon, which didn't arrive until oh, six or seven months after we arrived, the third echelon did come. But by the time the third echelon came, we'd shifted from Mali south to Helwan, about another 10 or 15 miles further south. So when did the third echelon, echelon, echelon arrive? Uh, well, they arrived not very long before the second one did.